Hi. I've just been going through the original script for uh, Switchblade Sisters, and it's a gem. I mean, it's like you, you could just flip it to any page, and there's like a great piece of dialogue going on. Like this one. This is from the movie you're about to see. Everything was great before Maggie came around. It's Maggie, ain't it? She ruined it all. Everything was lousy. You were lousy. This whole game was lousy. Just great. Okay, again, another one. Let's see. She's rotten you from the inside, Lace. The girls listen to her while you've been in the hospital. Nobody takes what's mine. If Maggie wants blood, she'll get plenty of it. And it, on and on and on and on and on. This is so far one of the funnest films that we've got releasing through the Rolling Thunder uh, video collection. It's directed by Jack Hill, and Jack Hill's films have always just been to me just some of the funnest exploitation movies made all throughout the 70s. He was sort of like the Howard Hawks of exploitation, insofar as he always like worked in different genres. You know. Now, let me give you a little clue as far as to watching this film is concerned. I watched this with audiences all over the place. And it starts off and the film is very funny and it's very high-pitched and hysterical. And I've watched it as audiences watch the film. Basically at first, they're, they're laughing kind of at the movie because it's one of those kind of movies. But then as it goes on, you kind of start realizing, no, this is, this is genuinely funny. This, is, this, this dialogue is really good and you start like laughing with the movie. But then a very strange thing happens and, and this is not the only Jack Hill film for this to happen. This happens in at least three of his other films. All of a sudden, you're at, watching towards the end of Switchblade Sisters, and all of a sudden, you realize you actually care about these people. <laughs> Unbeknownst to you, this crazy, hysterical movie, you've actually gotten invested in the characters. And you actually feel for the characters of Lace and Maggie, the, the girls that run the Jezebels, the tough all-girl gang that just kicks so much butt in this movie. Anyway. This is a blast. Sit back, enjoy, have fun. When the film's over, I'll be back and I'll be telling you a little bit more about Jack Kill, some more of his movies, some facts on some of the gals in the film, and just some general information, you know, cool information that Jack Kill told me about this film. Anyway, enjoy Switchblade Sisters. Wasn't that film great? Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that film was great? I didn't lie to you, did I? Now, I'm telling you this little story about uh, how this film came about. What had happened was, uh, Jack Hill had pretty much made most of his movies for uh, uh, either uh, uh, Roger Corman at New World Pictures or uh, um, uh, Samuel Arkoff at AIP. He broke off from those guys and started his own company with his producer, John Prizer. And the film was, and the company was called uh, Centaur Releasing. And so the first film that they did, you know, under this alliance, was a film called The Swinging Cheerleaders. And it was a smash. It did so well. It traveled through all the drive-ins of the South and in the North, and it was just, it was just a big hit. In fact, if you've ever seen uh, The Thin Blue Line, you'll remember in that documentary, the, the drifter says at the time that uh, the, the, the murder was happening, he was in a drive-in watching a cheerleader movie. Well, The Swinging Cheerleaders is the movie in that movie that he's watching. And if you've seen The Thin Blue Line, you'll see scenes from The Swinging Cheerleaders playing on the drive-in screen. Now, that was such a hit that they decided to get together and do another film right afterwards. And the cheerleaders were happy to you know, have them do another film because Swinging Cheerleaders was so successful. That film was a film called The Jezebels, which obviously Switchblade Sisters. All right, the whole film was called The Jezebels. That's how this title it was shot under. That's what they did. it. Anyway, the way they used to release exploitation movies back then is they would like take them from town to town to town. You know, kind of schlep them around, spend a little bit of money in this market, take them to St. Louis, spend a little bit of money in this market, take them to Baltimore, spend a little money in that market. Anyway, they open up uh, The Jezebels. All right, and it does horrible business. Nobody goes and sees it. And the theater owners all say, well, it was because of the title. The Jezebels, what's that? People thought it was a Betty Davis movie. You know, we've got to have something harder. We've got to come up with something harder. So they come up with the title, Switchblade Sisters. Okay, so now they're going to release under Switchblade Sisters. However, they have one more engagement that they have to do under the Jezebels. So they change everything to Switchblade Sisters except for this one engagement. They open up the film in this other engagement, and the film does great under the title of the Jezebels. The film does just absolutely fantastic. 
All right. So now, but now, okay, forget about that. Now they got to release it under the title Switchblade Sisters, and the film does bad everywhere it plays. All right, it doesn't do well at all. Opens and closes, and that's pretty much the end of that. Personally. I have to say, while Jezebel's is a little bit more organic, you know, you know, organically organic to the story, I actually like the title Switchblade Sisters better. I think it still describes the movie wonderfully. It makes no mistake about the kind of movie it is. Now, Switchblade Sisters is an exploitation film. Let me kind of just explain to some degree what exploitation cinema is, or at least what it was in the 60s and 70s. What, why they called it exploitation was because there were films that basically didn't have big stars or big production values. What they were, it, it had, but they had elements in there that you could exploit, either sex, violence, uh, action, you know, things like that. You know, that makes a, a snazzy movie poster. And uh, inside of exploitation films in the 60s and 70s, there were many different genres. There was, you know, the, the biker films, there were kung fu films, black exploitation films, spaghetti westerns, uh, good old boy car chase movies, women in prison films. Well, Jack Hill was sort of the Howard Hawks of this type of exploitation director. All right, he worked in pretty much every, you know, uh, most of the genres going. All right, he did horror films, he did women in prison films, he did black exploitation movies. You know, he is the man who discovered Pam Greer. He's Joseph von Sternberg to Pam Greer's Dietrich, that's for sure. Um, uh, he did a, a, a cheerleader movies. He even did a sword and sorcery movie. And this was his girl gang movie, but it also had a little bit of women prison in there. It had a lot of different types of films, you know, in Switchblade Sisters. To me, Switchblade Sisters is his masterpiece. And one of the things that makes Jack Hill so exciting, and what makes a lot of these exploitation filmmakers exciting, was they were coming at film with uh, um, uh, um, you know, a commitment to movies. And basically, when you'd make a deal with somebody like a Roger Corman or whatever, is you can make the film you want to make as long as you deliver it inside of a, a stock car racing movie, or as long as you do it inside of a black exploitation movie. Well, I want to make the Battle of Algiers. Okay, set it in Watts and make it about a bunch of black revolutionaries. All right, but if you do that, you can do whatever movie you want to make. Jack Hill would take these, you know, assignments that he get, was given, and he was never looking forward to do these movies. He was just took the next assignment coming on. But then, by the way, he wrote them, and the way you know he worked in with this, like all of his films have the same kind of comic rhythm that Switchblade Sisters has. You know, he built something meaningful out of it. And yeah, they're fun, and yeah, you're hooting and hollering, and you're having a good time. But as the movies go on, you realize, you know, the fun is not random. It's not just a mistake. No, it's it's building on the film as rhythm. You're you're building on the on the jokes, and there's, there's a very interesting uh, dialogue rhythm going on in um, Switchblade Sisters, where it's like you know normally dialogue is built to like a rhythm of pitch. This way my dialogue usually is. It's like you know da 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 ba. All right, he's building a musical beat with the dialogue, and then undercuts it, all right, by throwing like more or less a word that is the equivalent of a bad note at the end of the crescendo. So it's on the beat, off the beat constantly. You know, that's why one of the reasons why this movie, the dialogue sounds so strange, because it seems to be building up a rhythm and then purposely, you know, backs it up. Now, another interesting thing about the way Jack Hill conceived this movie is Jack Hill was always taking, um, uh, Jack, Jack Hill is, a, is a, a, a Shakespeare aficionado, and he was always using Shakespeare as uh, the basis for his movies. All right, uh, at the end of Coffee, when uh, the main bad guy is trying to convince Coffee to come back to him, you know, that's Richard the Third. That's that's the last scene in Richard the Third. All right, uh, Switchblade Sisters is Othello. It's set up straightforward. It's Othello and Patch. All right, uh, Monica Gale in the film is basically, you know, without a doubt, playing Yago. And not only is she playing Yago, she's playing Yago great. As far as I'm concerned, it's one, she's one of the best uh, 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 Yagos in uh, uh, film history. She does a great job with the film. And it's like, a, and so the whole film has this kind of like, you know, Othello structure to it. Um, Jack Hill, some of the other films you can get if you like his stuff uh, The Big Birdcage, The Big Dollhouse, both starring. Uh, 
uh, Pam Greer, all right? Then the two big Pam Greer vehicles, uh, Foxy Brown and Coffee, Coffee being the best. But recently they just came out with uh, the Foxy Brown a soundtrack by Willie Hutch on CD. Got to get that one. It's a great soundtrack. All right, as well as... Uh, uh, um, uh, Pit Stop he is a, a stock car racing movie. Spider Baby, probably his strangest movie that he's ever done, starring uh, Lon Chaney Jr. and the Swinging Cheerleaders. All right, the, if you like this film, you see the film that led up to it, the Swinging Cheerleaders. Anyway, that's it for this edition of Rolling Thunder Video. Until then, see you then. <laughs>